Welcome to Cooking School. Today's show is all about mushrooms. Mushrooms are a surprisingly versatile ingredient that add both texture and flavor to any dish. In the past, the only type of mushroom that you could find was the white button mushroom, this little creature. Now there is a vast variety of wild and cultivated mushrooms. We're using chanterelle today to create a delicious filling for savory buckwheat crepes. We're using shiitake, porcini, and cremini mushrooms in a ragu so meaty that you won't believe it's vegetarian. And then we're going to show you how to make a rich cream of mushroom soup, made with a variety of mushrooms for an earthy, flavorful soup. And finally, a modern twist on mushroom risotto, using an ancient grain called farro. I like serving mushrooms in many, many different ways, and rolled up in buckwheat crepes, they are utterly delicious. For this particular recipe, we're going to use a half a cup of buckwheat flour with a half a cup of all-purpose flour. Uh, for the batter itself, use a blender, one and a third cups of whole milk, four whole eggs. I add the liquid first and then the dry ingredients on top of the liquid. And the batter for crepes should be made eight hours or more in advance. The day before is best. And with the four eggs, we're going to add some melted butter, three tablespoons, unsalted, some salt, three quarters of a teaspoon, half a cup of buckwheat flour, and a half a cup of all-purpose flour. If you used all buckwheat flour, uh, the crepes would be a little bit heavy. So now, blend this on Low to start, increase the speed a little bit. So that's it. Now, just decant into a measure like this. You can make about 24 to 30 beautiful crepes. Make sure you cover this and refrigerate. We have some that's already rested, and here it is. The consistency is like very heavy cream, and this is a one ounce metal ladle. I have some butter that's kind of at room temperature, but I find that brushing the pans really works very well. Now, first crepe, you put your ladle of batter and then just cover the entire bottom. And when you see little tiny bubbling holes throughout the crepe, it was ready to turn. So it really takes just a moment of practice and you'll become a crepe maker in your own right. Now that's a pretty crepe. You can see that just in a few minutes you will have lots and lots of crepes. So now I'm making the mushroom filling. Three tablespoons of butter, a large shallot, and two big sprigs of fresh thyme. You can use dried thyme if you don't have the fresh. And what we're using today is chanterelle and cremini. This is a cremini mushroom, which is basically a variety of the white mushroom that we're so used to seeing in the grocery store. It is brown though and very tasty. And this is the beautiful chanterelle with the very delineated gills underneath the trumpet and the beautiful top. Up at my house in Maine on Mount Desert Island, we have lots of these in the autumn, especially if it's a rainy summer. So all of these mushrooms go into the butter and shallot mixture. 10 ounces of chanterelle, 10 ounces of cremini. And saute until the moisture starts exuding from the mushrooms themselves. But look how pretty and oh, so fragrant. And now right before they are done, add a quarter of a cup of dry white wine. Now before you finish the recipe, you should put these in a bowl just to cool a little bit before we add the creme fraiche. Half a cup of creme fraiche just to enrich them. If you don't have creme fraiche, you can use sour cream. Add a little bit of black pepper, a little bit of salt, and you're ready to form your crepes. Take the prettiest side and that'll be the outside. And be generous with the mushrooms, but not so generous that the crepe falls apart. And just fold these into triangles like that. 
So this can be done in advance of your party. And these are going to go right into a warm oven, 350 degrees, until they're warm through and a little tiny bit crispy around the edges. So the way I like to serve these crepes is with a fried egg. I like a little color around the edge of the white and put the egg on your plate and two crepes and enjoy. These crepes will make an impressive addition to your buffet, whether it be for holiday or every day. A staple of northern Italy's Bologna region, ragu sauce is typically made with meat, usually three kinds of meat. But you'll be surprised to learn that you can make an equally robust and flavorful vegetarian option using a combination of dried and fresh mushrooms. The first step is to soak your dried mushrooms, and these are two ounces of porcini, cover with boiling water. They not only plump up, they get soft. We're using just the mushrooms, not the water in which they're soaked, because that makes it just a little too strong, what we're doing. But look, already the desiccated mushrooms are plumping up. Once the mushrooms are soaked, strained, and chopped, just a small amount adds an enormous flavor to a dish. Porcinis are also known as seps, so your grocer might think of them as seps. Next, to start with a sofrito, uh, the basis of a lot of Italian cooking. A sofrito is onion, carrot, and celery. In other cultures, the sofrito might be called a mirepoix in French, or a trinity, which uh, is slightly different in the New Orleans cuisine, because it has green pepper in it. And just chop this up kind of coarsely. The beauty of this ragu is not everything is going to be hand chopped. Chopping in the food processor is perfectly okay. About an eighth of an inch dice is what you want. To do this, you have to have a sharp blade in your food processor. So into six tablespoons of butter melted in a deep pot like this. Start sauteing your onion first, and then your carrot and celery. And the onion should have a little bit of salt. Gets that sweating process going. Very nice and quick way to deal with the onions. If you don't have a food processor, of course you can chop finely by hand. See how nice this looks? Saved a lot of time. Scrape this into your onion. And now the last thing to chop before the mushrooms, the celery. It's gonna take about 25 minutes for this to cook down and caramelize a little bit. So in this particular ragu, we're using a mixture of cremini and shiitake mushrooms. Shiitakes uh, have a really earthy flavor with a buttery texture. This is the cremini. Cut these into quarters before you put them into your processor. And another thing to look for in mushrooms is that the cap of the mushroom is attached with that little fluffy skin all the way around the stem. If it's separated on this kind of mushroom, uh, it is not fresh. And look for others that are attached. So we'll chop up the cremini. That's good. So after 25 minutes, this is what the sofrito should look like. And now you can add your mushrooms. And I add them one by one as I chop them. This, of course, is the cremini. Smells so good when they're chopped, it's really fantastic. And now you can chop your shiitake. This is a shiitake mushroom with the stem attached, usually a little bit of dirt on the stem. Just remove the stem and cut the caps into quarters. Shiitakes are a shaggy capped uh, mushroom uh, cultivated in China about 800 years ago. They found them growing on fallen logs in hardwood forests, such as oak or the she tree from which it gets its name. 
And now, of course, they're cultivated in many places. I've even successfully grown shiitakes in my basement. So here is the cremini cooking with the sofrito. And now chop your shiitakes. The stems of the shiitake are really fibrous, so leave those out. But uh, you can just add those to a, a stock pot. They are very flavorful. So here goes the shiitake. These cook down a lot because mushrooms are about 90% water. Now we're going to add our beautiful porcini mushrooms. And now I'm chopping, not in the food processor because these kind of turn into mush in the food processor. These are the soaked porcini. You can add that broth, that water uh, to your stock pot, but don't put it into the sauce. And so just chop these up to about the same texture as the other mushrooms. You can see how tender they've become. So these get added right to your ragu. Now, doesn't that look kind of like meat? Nice browned meat. You can imagine it is, but actually it's more fragrant and extremely delicious. So there, these get incorporated. And now four cups of crushed tomatoes. Make sure they are seedless, skinless tomatoes. And the last thing that goes into the sauce, a little herb bouquet made out of fresh basil, marjoram, thyme, and rosemary. Just make a little bundle in cotton cheesecloth. And you can twist this, tie it with a little piece of cotton string. And so just drop that right in. All the flavors will be imparted into your ragu. And now simmer this for about an hour. Add some water towards the end of the hour and then cook for another, say, hour, hour and a half. And you will have a very, very tasty ragu. So our ragu is done. Now remove that. We've cooked one pound of rigatoni. And I like to get big noodles out of the boiling water like this. And a little bit of moisture in the serving dish is good because it will help thin that very thick sauce. Now, one cup of grated Parmesan cheese sprinkle over your noodles. And spoon over some of your beautiful ragu. This can be completely mixed in. And I don't like to use a metal spoon. I sometimes find that it cuts into the pasta itself. So use a wooden spoon. Serve with extra cheese, extra salt and pepper, and a sprinkling of fresh parsley. And there you have mushroom ragu with delicious rigatoni. Enjoy. Mushrooms lend themselves very nicely to soups. My mom always made her Polish mushroom soup, which we all adored growing up. I still love it. Also, cream of mushroom soup, really delicious as a starter to a dinner party. Start with four tablespoons of butter and a half a cup of finely minced onion. Sweat the onion in the butter. And while this is sweating, you can prepare your mushrooms. So the shiitake should be sliced like that. And the cremini caps should be sliced crosswise like this, thinly and evenly if possible. And you'll need quite a few mushrooms. Altogether, three pounds of mushrooms. And we have these beautiful oysters, which can also be sliced lengthwise right through the whole bunch like this. So these are so tender, these oyster mushrooms. Watch your onion, you do not want to brown it. As soon as they are translucent, add six tablespoons of flour to the pot. This will be your thickener. And for the three pounds of mushrooms, we're going to add 12 cups of flavorful chicken stock. So this creamy mushroom soup, creamy French mushroom soup, is not a puree, it is a flavorful base with the sliced cooked mushrooms in it. 
And to the stock, you can also add a couple sprigs of parsley, dried thyme, and one bay leaf. So now you start to saute your mushrooms, starting with the heaviest and densest mushroom, the cremini in this case, in four tablespoons of butter in a big skillet, because ultimately we're just gonna add all the mushrooms to this skillet. Now remember, if you add a little bit of salt, it helps get the juices moving in those mushroom slices. Keep stirring gently, don't press too hard. You don't wanna break those beautiful mushroom slices. And because mushrooms have so much water content, they really do cook down to a fraction of their volume. So now add your shiitake mushrooms, which are a little bit denser and heavier than your oyster mushrooms. And these two can have a sprinkling of salt. And add your most delicate of the three mushrooms, your oysters. And these two will be sprinkled with a little bit of salt and the juice of half a lemon. And cook these until they take on a little bit of color and we will then add them to our simmering broth. So here are our mushrooms. They are a nice color. Now this is the soup. I like to strain it and put it through a fine sieve into another pot. This will take out any little pieces of unwanted onion, any herbs. Now for the enrichment, four egg yolks and one cup of heavy cream. And one reason why it is so very tasty is the presence of cream. Now add a little bit of that very hot broth. This will temper the egg yolks, lightens the color of the soup, and add the whole thing back to your broth. Keep the soup on low, but keep it hot. Now add your mushrooms. Carefully add them to the enriched broth. Now if you find that your pans are too heavy to lift like this, just spoon out the mushrooms. I've gotten used to dealing with big pots. Notice how I'm picking up the pot with the spoon. You have to do things like that to make it work. So here is our cream of mushroom soup. Rather than boiling the soup, causing it to curdle, just ladle it into piping hot bowls and a little garnish. Parsley leaves will be delightful. And this is a really fine beginning to a fine meal. Risotto, the celebrated rice dish of northern Italy, can uh, just as easily be made with other grains such as farro. Today I'm combining this ancient nutty tasting grain with the earthy flavor of mushrooms in a delicious mushroom farro risotto. So we're using four types of mushrooms in this risotto. We're using the oyster mushroom. These grow in these beautiful clumps on the sides of trees. When cooked in butter, they have a gentle flavor reminiscent of seafood, thus the name oyster. And they really do look sort of like oysters. Now, hen of the woods mushrooms, this is another clumpy mushroom. They're a dark brownish gray cultivated mushroom that resembles a tightly ruffled puff edged with white or dark. And these are beautiful too. Their name is said to come from the fact that its shape vaguely resembles the body of a hen. And I think it does, look, that's like the tail of a nice hen. Shiitake mushrooms we've already discussed, but these are also cultivated. They have a little bit of a tough stem, so we're taking the stems off for this and slicing the tops. And these are the morel. These are a woodland mushroom uh, that have very, very tightly convoluted caps that are sort of like dunce caps. And these have a lot of depth of flavor. And these I've just washed and they are extremely clean. Done. So now heat two tablespoons of olive oil in a big skillet and just saute until they're soft. Notice that the smaller shiitakes and the morel are just left whole. These are to be served on top of your farro risotto and they will look beautiful and taste delicious. So let these saute while you prepare the farro itself. Another two tablespoons of olive oil 
half of a medium onion, peeled and sort of finely chopped. A little bit of salt and pepper, and cook the onion until it is translucent. Don't brown it. Now your mushrooms, they are looking so beautiful. Again, watch the temperature. So you can sprinkle these with salt also, and a little pepper. Once the onions are translucent, add your farro. One cup. This farro, by the way, has a dense, chewy structure and a rich, nutty flavor. I'm adding this right to the onion and olive oil mixture. And I want to lightly toast the farro. You'll hear maybe a few little pops. It's an ancient grain belonging to the wheat family. It dates as far back as mm, 20,000 years ago and was the primary grain cultivated by the early Egyptians. And because farro is easily digested and very low in gluten, it can be eaten by people who are normally gluten intolerant. Very good grain. My daughter feeds lots of farro to her kids. They love it. Let's see now, look at, look at the mushrooms, how pretty they look. Now don't overcook them. Turn it down to low. And as soon as the farro is toasted, and it looks good, add a half a cup of white wine. Let that reduce by, oh, three quarters. And then, just as you would in a risotto, you'll add your liquid little by little until it's absorbed. And when the farro stops absorbing, you know that the farro is done. So you keep adding about a half a cup of broth at a time. And I've enriched the broth. You can use beef broth or chicken broth or vegetable broth, uh, depending on your preference. And you can enhance the broth if it's canned broth by adding a carrot, some celery, a bay leaf, some onion, just to make it more yours. And once boiled, the farro should be tender, but retain a pleasing firmness when you bite into it. A normal risotto using arborio rice takes about 18 minutes. This takes about 30 minutes, so have patience. So here's our farro. Look how plump it got. It really does double in volume. Season with a little additional salt and pepper taste, of course. And in the final moments, you can add two tablespoons of butter, just as you would in a risotto, and approximately half a cup of freshly grated Parmesan cheese. It should be piping hot, moist as this one is, and oh, a tablespoon or so of freshly chopped parsley and it is ready to serve. I like serving it in a flat bowl like this with a topping of these spectacular mushrooms. Try to get some of each. And there you have a spectacular farro risotto that will please pretty much everybody in your house. I hope this lesson has inspired you to try different varieties of mushrooms in your cooking. You're gonna discover how wonderfully diverse their flavors and textures are. Thank you very much for watching and please tune into the next episode of Cooking School. Remove the stems from shiitake mushrooms. Place the caps on a baking sheet and drizzle with olive oil. Turn and drizzle again. Season with salt and pepper. Roast at 400 degrees, turning once until crisp, 35 to 40 minutes. Season with more salt. Serve warm or at room temperature. Today's show is devoted to the glorious onion. Did you know that in addition to serving as food, onions were prescribed to alleviate headaches, snake bites, and hair loss? They were even used as rent payments and wedding gifts. Well, times have certainly changed, but onions remain key to so much of our cooking. We will start with a rich French onion soup made with yellow onions and served with homemade croutons and melted cheese. Next, I'll teach you how to glaze tiny red and white pearl onions with butter and balsamic vinegar, a perfect side dish. And finally, everyone loves to order onion rings in a restaurant, and today I'll show you how easy they are to make at home using a secret ingredient.
onions, cheese, stock, and bread. Four simple ingredients that become a transcendent bowl of soup. In this classic French recipe, onions are slowly caramelized to bring out their natural sweetness and cooked in a rich beef stock. And when topped with a crouton and melted cheese, the simple soup is perfect if you're craving something warm and hearty. And it's good all times of year. To start with, we're using big yellow onions. And what I do is peel them and cut them in half this way, top down. And then slice them like this into thin pieces. It makes a very nice presentation in the soup. And it's a little bit unusual rather than slicing them that way. This is a very pretty presentation. So we'll need two pounds of yellow onions. And if the onions are large and glorious, such as these, you'll need probably four of these. My garden is full of great onions, and uh, I love making onion soup. Now, four tablespoons of butter in a heavy pot like this with a wide bottom. This is an eight-quart enameled cast iron. I love cooking in something like this because they have to get really, really caramelized to get that dark, perfect onion soup. So add your onions and start them cooking down. This takes quite a long time, about an hour. It's that caramelization process, that cooking down of the onions that really starts the soup tasting the way it should. As soon as they start to exude a little bit of their moisture, add one teaspoon of just granulated sugar. This helps speed up the caramelization process. This helps color the onions, giving it that sort of nutty brown color that is very desirable. I also add a little bit of olive oil just to keep the butter from burning. Stir, 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 cook, cook, cook. Now I do have a swap out of this so that we don't have to stand here for an hour. Now can you believe two pounds of onions have cooked down to this? It did take an hour, but they are exactly the way you want them. And now onto the hot onions in the hot pan, add one tablespoon of flour. This flour is the thickening agent for the final soup. It doesn't make it a real thick soup. You don't want that. But you want a little bit of thickness because we're adding about three and a half cups of stock. So cook down the flour. As soon as the flour is cooked, add a half a cup of sherry. You could add cognac. You could add white wine. Sherry is traditional. And you'll see the adding of the liquid actually helps you scrape up that foam that is in the bottom of your pot. That is the brown bits. That's the color for your final soup. So you want all of that scraped up. And I'm using one of my favorite wooden spoons, the flat bottom spoon, because it really does allow you to scrape without hurting your pot. Okay, so this looks really good. And already there's a little creaminess because of that flour. And now add your stock. This is a thick, rich, homemade beef stock. It's very gelatinous. Can you see the lumps? That's just the natural gelatin in the cold stock. I keep quarts of stock like that in my freezer so that when the mood strikes me and I have the right onion, I will make my onion soup. Now add two teaspoons of thyme leaves. Fresh thyme leaves are best. Season with a large pinch of salt. You'll have to adjust that seasoning. So now bring this to a boil. Reduce the heat to a simmer. If all your ingredients are added and everything looks like this, a nice dark brown color, just simmer for 30 minutes and your soup is done. Really, really important to use good quality ingredients. It will certainly make a difference in the flavor and the appearance of the soup. We have the soup ready to ladle. I love these. These are traditional onion soup bowls from France. You can use this kind or this. This has a handle. This has the two little ears. This is traditionally how it's served in a French restaurant or in France. A regular soup bowl will do if you don't have that. It's a little messy because those onions are long pieces. But divide this evenly. 
And actually, my favorite part of the soup is what's around the outside when it's finished. I like sitting there in the restaurant pulling that off or at home just pulling off the excess melted cheese. And each soup bowl gets three ounces of a mixture of Fontina, Gruyere, and Swiss cheese. If you want to serve a larger crowd or you want to put some of this soup in the freezer, I suggest making two times this recipe. You can wipe up a little bit. And now for the topping. This is French bread, a baguette cut on an angle. Uh, you'll need two of these. According to the recipe, you'll need them cut about three quarters of an inch thick. The bread gets very soggy and kind of incorporates itself into the soup. So now, four ounces of Gruyere divided evenly. This is delicious, this topping, and the three kinds of cheeses really add a lot to the final dish. And some Fontina. You could use all Gruyere if you like. That's pretty traditional. Or you could use Swiss. All Fontina is a little strong. And here's the Swiss. And I hope some of it melts down the sides. Use it all. You've grated it. You deserve it. Preheat your broiler so that it's at its hottest. This is going to go right into the oven under the broiler, just until the cheese is melted and a beautiful, beautiful brown. Placing your bowls on a rimmed baking sheet will allow you to more easily transport the soup bowls to the oven. Also, will prevent a lot of nasty cleanup afterward, because if this bubbles over, we'll have a mess. Watch it. <laughs> you don't want it to burn, but you do want it to melt and get a beautiful, crusty brown. They're very, very hot. Be very, very careful. And the way I like to serve these, straight out of the oven on a plate so that you don't have to touch the little soup pot. Piece of delicious baguette. That is lunch, first course, or snack. It's delicious. Just the thing to make when you want to warm up on a cold day. I have a pot of boiling water on the stove, and I'm going to glaze some delicious pearl onions. Glazing is a technique that cooks vegetables in simmering water, and when the water evaporates, the sugars left behind produce a lovely glaze. Balsamic vinegar is added in this recipe to flavor and to make them look even more fabulous. Now to peel, just take a little bit of the root end off with the point of a sharp knife and cut an X in the root. It's important not to remove the whole root end, just the hairy part, because you don't want the onion to fall apart. You want it to keep its shape. So here we have a bowl of white onions with their peels still on. Put those into the rapidly boiling water for just about 60 seconds. This will loosen the skins and start with the white onions if you're doing red and white. And I have a bowl of 10 ounces of uh, red already prepared with the little X right in the bottom. That's important because it does allow you to just slip off the skin. And have a bowl of iced water with a strainer. This will chill them just enough to enable you to handle them well. Put them right in. The spider, this wonderful strainer on a stick, we call it a spider, is so handy for something like this. And it's also handy for putting these onions into the boiling water. Now, in the meantime, you can try to slip off the skins from the white onions. This should work very simply. See how easily they just peel right off? Just like magic. I love when things like this work well. And generally, the outer skin and maybe the first layer of the onion should be removed for a pretty presentation. The stem end is also intact. That'll keep the onion's shape, that nice pointy tip of the onion. Do not cut that off. It's pretty. There. Perfect. Okay, so these are ready to remove. 
This technique of partially cooking is called blanching. It's used extensively when you're making crudité. You can blanch your string beans, your broccoli, your peas, your snow peas, your sugar snap peas, and see how pretty the red onion is? Just perfect. Good, so now we're ready to glaze these onions. Put your blanched onions right into three tablespoons of melted butter and stir them around so that they get coated. I have the heat on high. And in two measuring cups, we have a half a cup of dry white wine and one cup of water. Using the right amount of water is important. If you add too much, it can cause your vegetables to get too soft. If you don't use enough, your vegetables won't cook enough. So follow the recipe. Stir the onions around for a minute or two just to warm them, make sure that they are getting ready to cook in the wine and water bath. So I'm gonna add a half a cup of white wine and immediately add one cup of water. A little bit of salt and pepper. A good guideline is to add just enough liquid to almost cover the vegetables. Glazing like this is very nice with carrots, but I find that it also works extremely well for parsnips, for turnips, for fennel. All of those glaze extremely well. So the glazing is occurring. All the liquid has evaporated, and now add the flavor, which is a quarter of a cup of good balsamic vinegar. Balsamic vinegar is an aged red wine vinegar, and as it ages and evaporates, it gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter, and what you're left with is an amazingly pungent taste, but a sweet pungency. So here you have beautiful glazed onions. I'm gonna add a little bit more salt and a little bit more pepper. When you turn up the heat, the water evaporates and the sugars left behind mix with the fat, the butter, to coat the vegetables with what's called the glaze. And these have glazed absolutely perfectly. Cook until the onions are tender. You can test it with the point of a knife. I've already done that. I know that these are tender, but they're not falling apart. They still have their shape. And that whole process takes approximately 15 minutes. And once complete, you can put these right into a serving dish. And what you have is a dish that's simple enough for a weeknight, yet special enough for a holiday dinner. When you bite into an onion ring, texture is just as important as taste. A good onion ring should have a light, crisp exterior with a soft, sweet onion inside. Many people are intimidated to make onion rings, but after today's lesson, you'll see just how easy and delicious they are when made at home. Now I'm using two beautiful yellow onions, onions that look like this, and they've been peeled, and I'm slicing the onions themselves into half-inch slices. These slices will then be broken up into onion rings. Be very careful, use an extremely sharp knife. A sharp knife, because it cuts straight through the fibers of an onion, actually cuts down on the tearing, the emission of gas from the onion. So just let these break into rings. It'll, it'll take a little coaxing, but that's an onion ring. All over the world, onions are a very ancient and popular flavoring for food. And they've been cultivated for about 5,000 years. And now we're using safflower oil. You can use canola oil. Best to use a vegetable oil with a high burning point. Okay, well that's enough rings for now. And we will make our batter. One cup of flour, all-purpose flour is good a quarter of a teaspoon of white pepper, a teaspoon of salt, and surprisingly, but important, half a teaspoon of baking powder. Whisk all these together. And now here's the secret ingredient, beer. One cup of a lager beer. The beer contains carbon dioxide, which actually adds to the crispiness of the fried onion. 
So now this is a little bit lumpy. Don't worry about it. You want two tablespoons of iced water. It's a little similar to tempura batter. So here we have it. And alongside some all-purpose flour to first dip the onion ring in, then in the batter. And you just want one layer of onion rings in your batter at one time. I find it best to stir with a fork and drop with a finger. And they cook very quickly. They get golden brown very fast. Don't make a big, big batch of the batter. Just make it multiple times if you're making a lot of onion rings for a party or something. You want the action of the carbon dioxide from the fresh beer to be active. Keep the temperature around 375 degrees and use a deep fry thermometer that clips onto the side of your pot. It's a very useful tool in monitoring oil temperature. Flip this. Look at the great color. Oh my gosh. Now you don't want to overdo right onto a paper towel lined baking sheet. Check your oil temperature constantly. The best way to keep fried food from absorbing too much oil is to keep your oil at the ideal temperature. And for this, it is 375. So as quickly as you can, sprinkle with coarse salt while they're hot and arrange in a serving dish. I like to serve them on parchment like this. They look kind of pretty. Of course, for me, ketchup. Very important condiment for onion rings. A delightful little snack. One that we don't have very often, but when we do, we want them to look and taste and be just like these. These beer battered onion rings are great on their own or topped on a burger or steak. Try it, you'll enjoy. Another way to enjoy onions is to pickle them. This quick pickling method is great because it preserves the pink color of the red onions and it doesn't require the many steps of canning. Um, so in a pan, just heat a tablespoon of mustard seeds and a tablespoon of coriander seeds. Just warm them just to get the flavors going. Three cups of white balsamic vinegar. This is a little bit difficult to find, but a good grocer will probably have white balsamic vinegar. Three quarters of a cup of water, six tablespoons of sugar, and six tablespoons of salt. This is your pickling brine. Just heat that up a little bit just to dissolve the sugar and the salt. And now the onions are just cut in half and then slice like this, similar to the method I used for the onion soup. A nice way to cut onions. It's a little bit different and tests your knife skills. Use a very, very sharp knife. Essential for cutting onions. Now all of these onions Two red onions and two white onions will be packed in a canning jar. Red onions are milder than yellow onions, as are uh, white onions, much, much milder. These are Vidalia onions. And Vidalia onions were discovered by some farmers in Georgia. They discovered an onion with a really sweet and delicious flavor, and now it is a giant crop in Georgia. So pack the onions in a pickling jar, mixing white with red. I like these jars with the clamp tops and the rubber rings. They are very, very effective and pretty. You could use all one kind of onion for this. It seems like everybody's into pickling these days. Pickled food is very good for you. And the fermentation that goes on in pickling adds some very good features to vegetables. It's very good for your digestive system. And when you're pickling, it's very important that you use kosher salt or pickling salt. 
It has no iodine, no added minerals or anti-caking agents that many other salts have. So be careful about your choice of salt when pickling. So look how pretty this is. This is great. Add bay leaves to your jar. You can just stick them down the sides. And three sprigs of thyme. These two can be pushed down into the onions. They're going to decrease in volume as they pickle. So don't worry about having too many onions in a jar. You can press them down even further with a rubber spatula. I learned the art of pickling at my mother's side. She did so many different kinds of pickles and I still like to make pickles. We have our warmed spices, coriander and mustard, and our brine is almost ready. So just check to see that all the sugar and salt is dissolved. I think we can now pour the pickling liquid into a heat-proof measuring cup. This will make it easier to pour into the jar. I don't trust pouring from a pot into that mouth of the jar. And I must tell you, it smells very good. That balsamic vinegar has a unique aroma. So now this gets poured right into your onions. Cover all the solids by about a half an inch. And then this can be covered and kept in the refrigerator for up to a week or 10 days. This is what happens after a week. Do you see the difference between this and this? All of the onions have taken on the pinkness of the red onion. They are crispy, tasty, mellow, and a wonderful, wonderful accompaniment to grilled fish, chicken. They're wonderful on hamburgers. Oh my gosh, so good. And they don't leave your breath smelling oniony. So try pickling some onions. It's a great way to complement the sweet flavors of onions. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you on the next episode of Cooking School. Combine two caramelized Vidalia onions with one cup of sour cream, two ounces of cream cheese, and one and a half teaspoons of white wine vinegar. Finally chop one quarter cup chives and add those to the bowl. Season with coarse salt and pepper and stir to combine. Chill until thickened, about one hour. Then serve with crudite or chips and enjoy. Welcome to cooking school. Growing up in New Jersey, I used to think that Jersey corn was the best. But now that I have a house on Long Island, I think Long Island corn is even better. And I know each and every one of you has your favorite source for fresh corn. In today's show, I'll share some of my favorite corn recipes, starting with crisp corn fritters, small, savory, and deep fried. They are delicious, sprinkled with salt and served with, surprisingly, honey. Then the ultimate summer corn chowder, filled with small bites of potato and seasoned with fresh thyme and chives. And last, my recipe for creamed corn. Enriched with butter and cream, it will become your family's favorite. I cook with corn all summer. I love it steamed with butter and salt. I love to prepare it like they do in Mexico with chili and lime and cheese. And I also love to make corn fritters, which is my first recipe to teach you today. So first, you need two cups for corn fritters of corn removed from the cob. Husk the corn, take off all the silk as much as you can, and then with a very sharp knife on a cloth lined tray, as I'm doing, strip the kernels from the cob. Now the kernels from one regular ear of corn like this should equal approximately one cup of corn kernels. So let's see. You need two cups of corn kernels for this particular recipe. Mm, very close. 
And see how easy it is if you do it on a cloth like this to just sort of pick them up and put them where you want them. There. Certainly is just about one cup. So here's our two cups of corn. I've already done one ear. Reserve this one for the second batch. And it's funny thing with fritters and pancakes, there's always a second batch. Now there's no correlation, by the way, between the corn's color, which is derived from carotene, and its sugar content. But I must tell you, the fresher it is, the faster you cook it, the sweeter and better it will be. And people's preferences for corn color are largely based on where they come from and what they ate as a child. For instance, New Englanders generally prefer yellow corn or butter and sugar corn, which is that nice bicolor variety. This is a butter and sugar corn. And Californians usually favor white corn. Uh, we're using butter and sugar today. So we have egg, one egg. I'm making the batter now. Break up the egg. And the egg gets mixed with one tablespoon of sugar, two tablespoons of cornmeal. Cornmeal adds a nice crunchiness to your batter. Three quarters of a cup of unbleached flour, one and a half teaspoons of coarse salt, one and a half teaspoons of baking powder, quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, and a half a cup of milk. This is a stiff batter. You don't want a very wet batter because you're going to be dropping this batter with the corn in it into the hot safflower oil, which is heating on the stove right now. Better adjust the temperature. Let's see. We're up to 330. So adjust the flame so that the oil comes up to about 375. During cooking, the oil temperature should be around 360 degrees. It does cool off as you add your batter. So add your two cups of corn kernels. And easy as corn fritters, you have a very nice, light, fluffy batter. And this is ready to drop into the hot oil as soon as it reaches temperature. And I found that using an ice cream scoop makes nice round fritters. You can use, if you don't have one, this is a, a small one, it's about a tablespoon and a half size. If you don't have one of these, you can use two spoons and push it off two spoons. Okay, so now our temperature has just reached 375. And I'm going to use this little scoop and you just plop it right in. Do it in small batches because you don't want to lower the temperature of the oil too much. But you see how easy it is to use this instead of two spoons and it really does free up your other hand. Be careful not to drop it in. You don't want to splatter the oil. You want to be very careful. Have a piece of paper towel on a platter ready to take the fried fritters as soon as they come out of the oil, but they're turning a beautiful golden brown in just a matter of a minute or two. This kind of Chinese spider is a very, very good tool for deep frying like this. It does enable you to lift and not take too much oil with it. And you can really smell the corn. Those kernels of corn are cooking right in the pretty fritter. So isn't that a pretty sight? I'll put one more batch in. This is a handy tool. I don't know if you know what this is, but that's a splatter guard, just to keep the oil from splattering all over you. Little nubbins of corn. So if you start with oil that's 375 degrees, I would try to keep it at around 370 throughout the cooking process for good golden brown fritters that are cooked through and through in just a couple of minutes. So these cute little fritters can be served as a snack, as a side dish, and they can also be served as a first course. So we're getting about 26, that's pretty good. Arrange the drained fritters on a platter, heated platter, and serve these piping hot 
They don't get better as they sit out. They don't taste as good as when they are pretty hot. Golden balls of delicious seasonal corn. Serve them with honey. And a little bit of sea salt. Really delicious. So when you're cutting off kernels of corn from the cobs, don't throw away the cobs. This makes a delicious corn stock. It's very simple and easy to make, and it is delicious as a base for any dish where you may want to maximize the flavor of corn. Now this is perhaps the simplest recipe in all of cooking school. Five or six corn cobs, kernels removed, one large onion. I'm using a big white onion that's peeled and cut into quarters. This just goes right into the pot and add eight cups of water or so. This will give you a really flavorful corn stock, which can be kept in the refrigerator for four or five days, but frozen for up to three months. Bring this to a boil, reduce to a simmer, and cook for 45 minutes. You can flavor risotto with it, um, corn chowders, any kind of chowders, um, also tortilla soup. Very tasty. You'll enjoy it. Simple as that good corn chowder. There are, by the way, about 90 million acres of land planted with corn in the United States, but only about 1% of that is sweet corn, the kind that we like to eat off the cob. So once this is cooked for about 45 minutes, turn it off and pour it into a strainer. This is my favorite way to pour a large amount of bulky stuff. Just hold the cover so all the corn cobs and those onions stay right in the pot. And here you have a nice, clear, extremely fragrant, corny stock. I love how something as simple as this can be so utterly delicious. Now we associate chowder with places like New England and Manhattan, and today's chowder is made with fresh corn, potatoes, and cream. It is delicious, so let's get started. Four tablespoons of butter melted, one large white onion peeled and diced, about five cups of corn kernels freshly cut off the cob, salt, about a teaspoon, and cook this over a medium to low flame until the corn starts to exude its liquid. And don't forget a little bouquet garni of five or six sprigs of thyme. I like to wrap it up in cheesecloth like this because I don't want a lot of greenery in my chowder. For stock, we're using corn stock made out of the corn cobs. Very simple, as you saw. And just let this cook slowly for 20 minutes. Give it a stir every now and then. Do not burn or brown. So the corn has been cooking for about 15 minutes. Now it's almost time to add the potatoes. These are fingerling potatoes, which are in the markets pretty regularly now. And it's a small stubby potato, the length of a finger. Peel it clean, and then cut it into, oh, like half inch disks. These will cook nice and evenly. And they're an odd shape, so they're kind of curious. I like that. And we have five cups of corn stock. You can add that right now. And now add your one pound of fingerling potato discs. And you're going to continue cooking until the potatoes are tender to the point of a knife. So watch them carefully. You don't want the potatoes to fall apart, but you certainly want them tender and edible. So remove the little herb bouquet, 
the thyme packet. Looks very good. Now we're going to remove about a third of this and puree it. See how gorgeous and well cooked everything is? I'm going to take out a lot of the solids and puree what's left in the pot using an immersion blender. It works so well. And this will make the soup, the chowder, very nice and thick. Now be very careful when pureeing hot liquids like this. Don't splatter it on yourself. Be very careful not to uh, look away from the job. It's um, a little frightening to get hot liquid splattered on you. And don't lift it out of the liquid while it's still going. So there, that looks good. Now add to the pureed portion of the soup three quarters of a cup of heavy cream or I'm using half and half. That's rich enough for me. Um, nice sprinkling of black pepper, a sprinkling of salt. Stir that around. You can see what the consistency is. It's lumpy a little bit, but still greatly pureed from what's here. Now I would pour the hot liquid right over the still intact corn and potatoes. Serve this while it is piping hot. I think I'm going to have a big bowl of this soup. This is really pretty. Each bowl can be gently garnished with very finely cut chives. It's very nice with the corn and the potatoes. You can let people add more salt or pepper as they like. And if you're like some people in my family, make sure you have a little hot sauce on the side. It really enlivens the flavor of the corn. So hot sauce for you, none for me. Beautiful, beautiful corn chowder. I grew up in Nutley, New Jersey, and I must say there is nothing we wait for more than July and August corn. People look forward to it all year long. Corn begins to lose its sweetness the moment it is picked. All those delicious sugars start to turn to starch. So the faster you cook it after it's picked, the better. Uh, and I always ask, when was this corn picked when I go to the farm stand? And uh, if the answer is anything but, oh, an hour ago or this morning, I don't buy the corn. So I want to show you basically one way to cook the corn, because people are always asking, how long do you cook it? What do you do with it? How do you serve it? And this is just stovetop corn in a large pot of boiling salted water. Some people add milk to the water. Some people add sugar to the water. I just add salt, especially if you have good, fresh, sweet corn. Put your corn cobs into the rapidly boiling water and try to clean the corn really well. Get all the pieces of silk off it and you want to shuck it so that the ears are nice and clean and let that cook and time it. Five minutes for a fresh picked small kernel corn, maybe a few more minutes for the larger kernels uh, like this. Bring it to a rapid boil. When you're choosing corn, always look for ears with bright green, snugly fitting husks, and golden brown silk. And inside, the kernel should come um, all the way to the very top. And you want to buy the corn that you love the best. Yellow corn has larger, fuller flavored kernels. White kernels are generally smaller and sweeter. This has been in for six minutes. Just drain it on a cotton towel, and you can cover it with a cotton towel too. That'll keep it nice and steamy hot till you get it to the table. Looks good, smells good. 
So what I like to do is just take the ear of corn and a tablespoon of butter and just hold it like this and coat the whole thing with butter. And then as much salt as you like. Sprinkle the whole thing and just start chomping away. That's corn on the cob. Now here is an alternative method of eating corn that I find utterly delicious. I went to Mexico City last year and I couldn't believe how fabulous the Mexican street corn was. It's served on sticks like that and the corn is coated with either sour cream or a tablespoon or so of mayonnaise, hot corn, just slather on the mayo. Ugh, it's so good. And now sprinkle with a little cayenne pepper all over and roll this corn right into queso fresco, Mexican white cheese. And serve that just like that with some wedges of fresh lime. That's Mexican corn on the cob. It's best to spread the condiments on the corn while it's still hot, and that'll ensure that the fats will melt in between the kernels, providing even more succulent eating. So whether you choose to have Mexican corn like this, or just plain corn on the cob with butter and salt, they're both delicious. Enjoy. I'm sure when many of you think of creamed corn, it brings back memories of something that can easily come from a can. But this popular side dish was common in the American Midwest long before it became an American canned staple. Made with fresh corn kernels and cream, this homemade creamed corn is nothing like the canned version. And uh, it's very easy to make. So I'm just finishing cutting off the kernels from eight years of corn. And uh, as soon as I'm done with this, take the pulp from the cob with the edge of a spoon. What comes out from each and every one of these little indentations is what's known as corn milk. And just scrape it like this. So you can see that's what corn milk is. Put that right in with the kernels. It's very flavorful, very tasty, it's sweet, and adds a great, great flavor that the kernels alone just can't match. So this is an essential part of the traditional American creamed corn. All this gets added to the bowl. And in a big skillet, saute in some butter, four tablespoons of butter, one onion, finely chopped. So just start the onions cooking a little bit, then add your corn kernels and corn milk, and one cup of water. Let this cook for approximately 20 minutes. Now add one cup of water, bring that water to a boil, and it'll come to a boil rather quickly. Reduce it to a simmer and cover and cook until the corn is very tender, 25 to 30 minutes. And don't discard those cobs. Turn that into your wonderful corn stock. Very, very easy, as I showed you. Onion, corn cobs, and water. It's boiling, reduce it to a simmer. Cover and cook. Now this has been cooking for 20 minutes. It looks very pretty. Add one and a half cups of heavy cream. This is not diet food, but it is good food. Bring this to a boil and cook until the mixture thickens. While that's happening, you can Add one teaspoon of sugar. Oh, about a half a teaspoon of salt and a quarter of a teaspoon of black pepper. So no bechamel, no flour, nothing but corn to thicken corn. And 
I think this with a pork roast with a nice big pork chop. Remember, most of the corn in the United States is grown in Iowa, where there's also a lot of pork, and that's where they make a lot of creamed corn. Very, very delicious. Serve it piping hot, and it really is best just served immediately after making. It takes about four to six minutes for this to thicken up. You can use some of this creamed corn poured into the center of a cornbread before you bake it. It adds an extraordinary texture. And you can also probably turn this creamed corn into a very nice corn pudding with the addition of egg and uh, grated cheese. Uh, adjust the seasoning to your liking. There, this is nice and thick. And it looks really, really different than the version that comes from the can. So there, I think that's cooked enough. Ladle that into your serving dish. And serve. Creamed corn, an American classic. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you for the next episode of Cooking School. Coarsely chop two tablespoons of cilantro. Transfer to a bowl with four tablespoons of room temperature butter. Add a half a teaspoon of grated lime zest and one and a half teaspoons of lemon juice. For a classic Mexican combination, add a quarter teaspoon of chili powder. Season with coarse salt and pepper and mix to combine. This tangy, spicy butter is just right with a grilled ear of sweet corn.